Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. For behold, you look for truth deep within me and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin and I shall be pure. Wash me and I shall be clean indeed. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me the joy of your saving help again and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. I shall teach your ways to the wicked and sinners shall return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness. O God of my salvation, open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. Had you desired it, I would have offered sacrifice, but you take no delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Amen. Good evening. Good to have you for our Ash Wednesday service. My Ash Wednesday sermon is Press On. Hosea chapter 6. Come, let us return to the Lord, for it is He who has torn us, and He will heal us. He has struck down, and He will bind us up. After two days, He will revive us. On the third day, He will raise us up, that we may live before Him. Let us know Let us press on to know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. The prophet Hosea's poignant poem here gets to the heart of what repentance and the season of Lent is all about. I think we need to, I think we need to recover the word repentance. It's fallen out of favor, favor. It's, it's, maybe it's carrying some baggage, but repentance is not a dour word invoking self-hatred, far from it. Uh, repentance is a tremendous word of hope. The philosophy of repentance is that we can change. That we don't have to stay stuck in that which is so deeply dysfunctional in our life, we can change. The possibility of repentance saves us from the preacher's despair in Ecclesiastes, when the preacher says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What has been is what will be, and what is done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. (laughs) Well, if that's true, then indeed, all is vanity. Fortunately, that's not the final word in Scripture. Jesus is what God has to say. And when Jesus arrives on the scene following his baptism in Galilee, 
the first thing he preaches is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Rethink your life because the kingdom that God is bringing from heaven is within our grasp. To repent is to rethink the trajectory that our life is on and if need be, make the necessary adjustments that can get us back on the right path. Come on now, we wanna be on the right path. We don't, we don't, wanna, we don't wanna get off. And repentance is that course correction. Get us, get our trajectory right again. Hosea here says that if we return to the Lord, he will revive us and he will raise us up. Now, Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of the season that leads us not to death, but through death and into the promise of new life in Christ Jesus. So, in case you don't know, we're headed for Easter. <laughs> that, that's what all this is about. We're headed for Easter and the promise of new life, but it goes through death. That, that's how we get to the new life because there's some things that need to die. Can anybody be that honest tonight? And say, yep, there's some things in my life that would be better off dead. All right, so that's, that's what Lent is for. That's what it's about. Uh, so let's look again at this at this text here, this prophetic poem of Hosea. Hosea 6, verse 1. Come, let us return to the Lord, for it is he who has torn, and he will heal us. He has struck down, and he will bind us up. Now, I know some people are like, they're, they're a little bit alarmed by that. The Lord has torn us. The Lord has struck us down. Oh, well, indeed. We just heard that great penitential psalm, Psalm 51. The occasion of its composition is that the prophet Nathan comes to David after his egregious sins of adultery with Bathsheba and then murdering her husband Uriah to cover it up. And Nathan the prophet comes to David the king with a parable. And the final point of the parable is, David, you are the man that has done these things. And in that moment, the word of the Lord strikes down David. In in that moment, when, when the word, because he, you know, he had sort of shielded himself through self-deception. But now all of that is shattered as the word of the Lord comes to him and strikes him down. So that in that psalm, David says this, let me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Well, I mean, David didn't have any broken bones. But he's saying, the word of the Lord came to me like that which would break the bones. The word of the Lord hit me that hard and I had to repent. I still remember, and it was nigh on 20 years ago now, I was sitting with Jesus. I was early in this practice, this contemplative practice. And I was, I was just, minding my own business, <laughs> sitting with Jesus. When out of the blue, without really anything to prompt it, it's as if Jesus played back in my mind an incriminating surveillance video. I saw myself for many years later being entertained by the the bombing of Baghdad. I had pizza, I laughed, it's like I was watching the Super Bowl, except people were dying, being killed. 
And I was just so, I don't know, I mean, so not aware that I could eat pizza, laugh, and call it entertainment. And many years later, sitting with Jesus, that scene is played back in my mind, and I heard Jesus say, that was your worst sin. Okay, that tore me up, that struck me down. That was from the Lord, and it broke something in me that needed to be broken. God wounds us with his word that he might heal us. Jesus is the physician that sometimes may have to break a bone to set it right. You know, these things will happen. You can, you, know, you're, you can be so out of joint that all the doctor can do is break it so it can be set right. And so in that moment, many years ago, the Lord was breaking something in me so that he could set it right. Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Oh, yeah. The devil just come up to you and kiss you and say, everything's all right. You don't need to change anything. You're perfect just the way you are. Give you a little kiss on the cheek and say, you know, don't worry about a thing. Everything's okay. The Lord might come to us with his word and wound us, but faithful are the wounds of that best of friends. Because then we can repent. Then we can change the trajectory. Verse 2. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we might live before him. Do you hear any echoes of Easter here? I mean, come on, you can't, you can't hear third day and not think Easter. And that's what we're headed We're headed for Easter. So the, the end is not the wounding of God's word in our life. The end is that after two days, he will, how does it say? After two days, uh, he will revive us on the third day. He'll raise us up. So we're, we're headed towards Easter and new life and resurrection. Verse three, let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the dawn and he will come to us like the showers, like the spring rain that, the spring rains that water the earth. Well, this is, this, is my, um, this is my verse. This is my verse for Lent. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. Maybe it can be yours too. I'll share it with you if you'd like it. You can have it too. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. We say, what are you, what are you giving up for Lent? I'm giving up complacency. I'm giving up complacency and my theme for this land is let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. So we have 40 days of Lent that stretch out before us. We're just at the beginning, plus the six Sundays. So 46 days all from now till April 9th. It'll take us past the end of winter into spring. That's what Lent means, spring. So let's, let's use this season of Lent, to go on a journey, to press on, to know the Lord, because the invitation comes with the promise. He will appear to us as sure as the dawn. I mean, there can be a, there can be a new dawn of Christ in your life between now and Easter. Somewhere along the next 46 days, from now till April 9th, there can be a new dawn. Of, I mean, anybody say, yeah, I want that. Right, that's what this is all about. And when, and when he comes with this new dawn, it will be like the spring rains, rains that bring refreshing to your soul. We're going to leave behind a dreary spiritual winter and press on into a new springtime. This Lent, we're leaving behind the winter of our discontent as we press on to know the Lord. Come on, anybody here been in a spiritual winter of discontent? All right, well, this Lent, 
We're leaving behind that winter of discontent as we press on to know the Lord. Now this theme of pressing on to know the Lord is taken up later, much later, by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. And of course, for Paul, the Lord is Jesus Christ. This is the revelation that he received on the Damascus Road that forever changed his life. Who are you, Lord? Meaning, who are you, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Who are you, Yahweh? And the answer comes, I am Jesus. And that changed everything. It changed everything in Paul's life. It changed everything ultimately in Western civilization. When Saul of Tarsus learns that the Lord is Jesus Christ. And so in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. So here Paul says that he wants to know Jesus Christ. But doesn't he already know Jesus Christ? I mean, of course he does. But only in part. The journey of knowing Jesus Christ is ever ongoing. You you don't get to say, "Mm, got that down now. I've got Jesus all known and everything. I mean, what if, I'm talking out of my own experience, but what if 20 years ago, I'd said, well, I know Jesus Christ and that's that. I've got that taken care of. I mean, I shudder to think. I mean, nothing would be the same now. I I mean, what if I knew Jesus today only as I knew him 20 years ago? Only. Uh, I'll tell you online, you people online, you would not be online. <laughs> if 20 years ago I said, well, I, I, I know Jesus and that's that, you would not be online with me right now because I wouldn't have anything to say that would interest you. That's, that's just the truth of the matter. So Paul says he wants to know Jesus and he wants to know the power of resurrection and, sh- and he says he wants to share in Christ's suffering. I, I don't know if we can relate to this. He wants to share in Christ's suffering. We, we don't know much about that. Not here. Not here. We don't know much about that. I don't know. I don't know what that would do for us. But just 10 days ago, I was with, I was with some Christians that for real know about it. I was in India with 387, let's call them bishops. That's essentially what they are. Leaders of leaders, pastors of pastors, 387 of them who are taking the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout North India And there has been a steady rise in in, in Hindu persecution of Christians from 1992 till now. And it continues to rise. Most of the pastors that we are associated with in Northern India have suffered persecution. By By persecution, I mean mobs have broken into their house and beaten them. 17 pastors recently had their houses burned down. But I'm hearing these stories. I've been talking, they're telling me these stories about their, their congregation of young converts 
And a mob sets upon them and says, renounce Christ or we will beat you. And they say, we will not renounce Christ. And so they beat him. And then they say, we're going to come back again. And if you don't renounce Christ, we'll beat you again. And yet they, they share in the suffering of Christ. I, we don't know about that. We don't know about that. So we're cynical and hard-boiled and grumpy. <laughs> I'm around these people that are actually suffering physical abuse for Christ. And I kid you not, you can ask, Perry, these, are, these people are just full of the joy of the Lord. Paul says he wants to somehow to, a, to attain to the resurrection from the dead. I don't think he means the final resurrection promised by Christ. He knows that he'll attain that. That's, that's Christ's own doing. But I think what he's saying here is that he wants to live a resurrected life here and now. I, I want to live as one who has already been raised from the dead in Christ right now. And of course, the whole thing about that is to live a resurrected life now, you also have to die now. I mean, some things have to die. Some carnality has to die. Hallelujah. That's what Lent is about. It's a time for these things to die so that we can be full participants in the resurrection life of Christ. Paul says his goal is to become like Christ here and now. He also says that he's not yet reached that goal of becoming fully like Christ here and now. He says, I, I haven't yet reached it, but, uh, but I press on. I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. And in pressing on, he says, you know, the one thing I do is I forget what lies behind. Anybody here? Anybody here? So I, I, I have failures in following Christ in my past. I have not always faithfully followed Christ. Sometimes I have failed to be Christ-like. What do you do about it? You confess it. You receive forgiveness for it. And then you forget about it. Forget about it. Just confess it, receive forgiveness, and then forget about it and press on. The journey is everything. And pressing on makes all the difference. Where we start with Jesus is only that. It's where we start. It's not where we end. Where, where we start with Jesus is not where we end with Jesus. It's just where we start. To attain to the goal of becoming like Jesus, we have to move. And see, this is, this is the problem with viewing salvation primarily as a status. I wasn't saved and now I'm saved. Once I wasn't saved, now I'm saved. I got, I got saved status. The problem with viewing salvation primarily as a status is it too, early, too easily turns into status quo Christianity where nothing moves anymore. You're just sitting around with your status <laughs> and it becomes status quo Christianity. Well, in the church calendar, transfiguration is followed by Ash Wednesday. This past Sunday, Transfiguration Sunday. Now it's Wednesday. It's Ash Wednesday. And the beginning of the long Lenten journey. And we are retracing the steps of Jesus. So at the, in Matthew's account of the Transfiguration, as they're coming down the mountain, okay, they, they've had the Transfiguration, they're coming down the mountain, Matthew says, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering and be raised on the third day. From that time on, that is from the time of the transfiguration onward, things change. The transfiguration is a turning point in the gospel story. So think of Lent as your own personal 46 day journey with Jesus a journey of pressing on to know the Lord. Uh, just stay in the Gospels. Just, just stay in the Gospels for these 46 days. That's what I recommend. Just stay in the Gospels. Just stay in the Gospels. And not, not, not even all the Gospels. From Transfiguration through Good Friday and the burial. Don't, don't jump to Easter yet. Well, hold on to that. Just, just stay right there. You know, it's Transfiguration. Matthew 17, uh, Mark 9, Luke 9. 
There is no transfiguration, John, because the whole thing's a transfiguration. So just pick up John after the raising of Lazarus. That is chapter 12. Start with chapter 12. And just 12 through 19 in John. So just, just stay in that, in, that, in that period of time with Jesus, which is all a journey from transfiguration. He's, he's setting his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. And we're traveling with him. We're doing this for 46 days. That's what the unvarnished Jesus is about. It's based on that anyway. So on this Ash Wednesday, I say, come with me. This Lent, we're leaving behind the winter of our discontent and the doldrums of the status quo as we press on to know the Lord. Amen. I'm excited about it. Now in a moment, we will be marked as pilgrims on this Lenten journey with an ashen cross, the imposition of ashes. We'll be marked as pilgrims of the cross. And with the imposition of ashes, we'll hear words that remind us of our mortality. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return, which is a poetic way of remember you're going to die. But no sooner will you hear those words of mortality than you will also hear words that promise immortality. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. And it's through the body and blood of Jesus Christ that we participate in his divine life and the promise of everlasting life. So I think we're ready to begin. Let's begin our Lenten journey now in a corporate prayer of public repentance. This will mark our beginning. And then we'll come receive the ashes and receive the Eucharist. And we'll be on our journey. Stand with me. I'm going to lead in a prayer of repentance. There are portions of this prayer for the congregation to participate in. Those will be marked accordingly. But the uh, most important thing is that right now in this moment, we be present to these words of repentance. We take them to heart and it becomes our own prayer. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and patience of our lives. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways and our exploitation of other people. Our anger at our own frustration and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. Our intemperate love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work. Our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to commend the faith that is in us. Accept our repentance, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. For all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors and for our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us. For our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us. 
Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Accomplish in us the work of your salvation. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Lord. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of sinners, but rather that they may turn from their wickedness and live, has given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all those who truly repent and with sincere hearts believe his holy gospel. Therefore, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and as his Holy Spirit and those things may please him which we do on this day and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now as we come to the table of the Lord, let us confess our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come. Because it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen.